Hello and happy Saturday, uh, Central Square Church. It's really good to be with you. Um, I'm in my office at home and I have a two-year-old upstairs and a mini golden doodle that you might hear during this recording. So just heads up there. So you guys are doing a summer retreat called Backyard Edition. And I have like these wonderful images of uh, a backyard in New England in the summer, if it's not raining, that is. And um, had a I have a friend. We have a church there, Reality Church in Boston. And uh, one of my close friends started that church, and I was there a lot. It seems like every time I went there, they had the best weather. He would always complain how it was really bad weather in the winter. But when I went there, somehow the sun came out, and he got mad at me every single time I visited because it was nice weather. And he's like not justified in how how bad the weather was to him. So, anyways, I have these great images of you guys. I hope you're grilling something great tonight. And um, I'm really, really glad to be with you all uh, for this uh, this retreat, um, or this uh, yeah retreat that you that we're all doing together. Today, I want to talk about being joyful in hope. Joyful in hope. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans five and Romans twelve. If you don't, I'll read it over you and with you. So no big deal there. If you're in the backyard, you might have a Bible handy. I don't know. Romans five. I'm going to read verses one through five, and then I'll read Romans twelve verses nine through twelve. Romans uh, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 12, verses 9 through 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be, and here's, here's the phrase of our sermon title, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. This is God's word. Let me just pray for us real quick. Lord, um, as I'm in San Francisco and they're in Boston and we're really far apart, thank you for the gift of technology that brings us together. And I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to us and lead us, God. And I submit to the authority of your word and I pray that um, what is true and what you say is true would be true about us and true to us, and that truth would transform us. Bless this congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first I want to start by talking about hope and how for the Christian, for hope to be mature in a Christian, for hope to develop in the follower of Jesus, for hope to take root in our lives, Christian hope needs pressure and it needs trials and hope needs suffering. So I'll talk about hope, and then I'll talk about joy, and I'll put those together at the end. So Christian hope actually needs suffering. And you heard that right. For hope to take root and develop in your life, suffering is required. Different forms of suffering, when gone through correctly, produces in us perseverance. And perseverance produces in us character, and character will result in hope. And this hope that that suffering, if done right, creates in us, is a kind of hope that will not disappoint. This is what Paul says. If this the suffering does what it's supposed to do, the kind of hope that it produces in us is a hope that will not disappoint. Now, how does all this work? Well, during quarantine last year, if you remember, I mean, I know we all remember quarantine, um, I asked people periodically what they were hoping for. I asked them in person, I asked them on social media. I got a lot of answers over the last year. One thing that stood out among all the different answers I was getting is that hope needs an object. People wrote in about how things they are doing to garner hope, things that they were like serving or praying or writing. Other people wrote about how things they were looking forward to and hope, like when things uh, like when shelter in place would lift. Right. And we're, we're kind of living in that now. Um, they hope when COVID was done, they would hope in something. When we talk about hope, hope needs an object. It needs something to latch onto, something to fix itself on. So what is the object of our hope? Because hope needs an object. For many of us, for a lot of us, 
who we are and the culture we're in, the object of our hope is our happiness. I'll say that again. For most of us, if we live in America, or if, I mean, if, if you, even if you've, you've just immigrated here, just give it enough time, and what happens is the object of our hope in America tends to be our happiness. It is written in our founding documents. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what is happiness? Happiness is getting control of your life so that you keep your circumstances favorable. This is our hope. As Americans, we want to keep our circumstances favorable for us and our people. If we were to uncover our true source of hope, not only as a society, but as individuals who live in the society, Christian or not, this might be the real object of our hope. It's getting control of our lives, our rights, our freedoms, so that our circumstances in my life are good, pleasurable, favorable, and happy. And this is why in our cultural framework, suffering doesn't fit into the paradigm of hope. You can't have suffering and happiness at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You can't have your life pleasurable, favorable, and happy <clears throat> and suffer. Those two things are incompatible. We live in a society that really wants to avoid pain at all costs. Timothy Keller, in his great book on suffering, says that most cultures around the world and throughout history, especially the major ones, have always provided answers to the question, what is the purpose of human life? He writes this quote, other cultures have provided its members with various question, answers to the question, what is the purpose of human life? Some cultures have said it is to live a good life and so eventually escape the cycle of karma and reincarnation and be liberated into eternal bliss. Some have said it is enlightenment and the recognition of the oneness of all things and the attainment of tranquility. Others have said it is to live a life of virtue, nobility, and honor. There are those who teach that the ultimate purpose in life is to go to heaven to be with your loved ones and with God forever. The crucial commonality is this. In every one of these worldviews, suffering can, despite its painfulness, be an important means of actually achieving your purpose in life. It can play a pivotal role in propelling you toward all the most important goals. One uh, could say that each of these other cultures' grand narratives, what human life is all about, Suffering can be an important chapter or part of that story. Then he goes on to say this, but modern Western culture is different. In the secular view, this material world is all that there is. And so the meaning of life is to have the freedom to choose the life that makes you most happy, the pursuit of happiness. However, in that view of things, suffering can have no meaningful part. It is a complete interruption of your life story. It cannot be a meaningful part of the, of the story. In this approach to life, suffering should be avoided at almost any cost or minimized to the greatest degree possible, end quote. See, for many of us in Western society, we have been taught, shaped, and indoctrinated by the idea that the highest purpose of life is individual happiness, comfort, and personal freedom. This is why suffering doesn't fit into our paradigm of hope, which is why I think that our hope has been hijacked. Christian hope has been hijacked, and it's been hijacked by planning and optimism. Your hope and my hope has been hijacked by planning. Planning has replaced hope in our culture. We don't hope, we plan. Eugene Peterson, in a lecture he gave on hope, said the difference between hoping and planning is planning is working out of our past and present and moving that into the future, trying to control the future or trying to anticipate it so you're ready for it. Isn't that genius? It's All planning is is taking your past and your present and moving that into the future. That's all, that's all planning does. And you're trying to control the future. Like I'm gonna plan to go here and Hawaii and this and that. I'm gonna do this, I'm, I'm gonna plan. I'm gonna make sure that I, I'm, I'm get on the plane and the Uber's gonna take me to the plane. The plane's gonna take me to Hawaii and Hawaii. I'm gonna get, and you plan it all out like, this is what I know about life. There's such thing as ride sharing, there's such thing as airports and airlines, and there's such thing as an island, and I'm gonna move my, what I know about the world into the future. Now there's nothing wrong with planning. I'm planning a trip as we speak to Hawaii. That's why it's the top of my brain. We all have to plan, and all over the wisdom literature in the Bible, we're told that the wise person plans well. But we can't confuse hope with planning. With planning, you know what it is. You know what you're planning for. 
You're moving your vision of the past and the present into the future, trying to anticipate it, trying to be ready for it. But theological hope is different in that it doesn't move your vision into the future. It anticipates God's action for the future. That's what Christian hope is. It anticipates what God's going to do in the future. Now, that might be a lofty theological idea, but how does that work? Well, my daughter and I, um, when she was uh, maybe one years old, she's two now, so the last year, we've been watching Daniel Tiger together. Daniel Tiger is, if you know, uh, if you don't have kids, Daniel Tiger is a character from Mr. Rogers that got animate his own animated spinoff. And it might be just as good as the original, just saying. Anyway, at the end of every episode, Daniel Tiger sits down like Mr. Rogers used to do and takes off his shoes in the entryway and sings the song that Mr. Rogers sang at the very end. It's such a good feeling to play with family and friends. It's such a good feeling to lend you a hand. And then it gets different in the middle. But then the song ends the exact same way as Mr. Rogers' song did. It says, it's such a good feeling, a very good feeling, a feeling you know that I'll be back when the day is new, and I'll have more ideas for you, and you'll have things you want to talk about, and I will too. You know, the, the first six months I watched Daniel Tiger with my daughter, I couldn't help but cry at the end of every single Daniel Tiger episode. It was embarrassing. I would literally like tear up, and I would talk to other dads. This is the thing, and other dads would watch it and get teared up too. Why, why, why? does this song bring so much emotion? And here's why. It's full of hope. This song is so, this end of this Daniel Tiger song is so full of hope. So much hope that my chest feels like it's going to explode. I'm sitting here holding my daughter and there's another episode coming. When the day is new, there'll be another episode out. And think of how Daniel Tiger was that loving creation of Mr. Rogers who was singing that to us, how one day he'll be back when the day is new. Like he was singing this to his um, his audience, knowing that one day he would not be there, but he would be back when the day is new because he had a Christian hope. If you didn't know, I'm sure you do know. And I see through all of that, I see Jesus Christ and how it's really Jesus singing, I'll be back when the day is renewed and how I'll have things that I want to talk about and he will too and we'll be together. This is the Christian hope. This right here is the Christian hope. That one day Christ will return with healing in his wings and wipe every tear from our eyes. And that one day will be new, renewed. And God will get what God wants for his world. And he will redeem and restore everything. Now, the fancy theological word for this is eschatology. And the difference between that and planning is I can't make that happen. I can't make Jesus come back. I can't make the world new like he can make the world new. I can't even plan it. I can only hope in it. I can only hope in Jesus. I can anticipate God's action in Christ. I can anticipate it and base my life around it, but I can't make it happen. But hope is not just about the future. Theological hope must work its way into our present. Because hope has to do with the future, but it fills our present with energy. It connects us to the promises and the character of God. Hope injects the presence with the purposes of God. Biblical hope is a vision of life that guides itself by faith in God's promise, irrespective of whether the situation looks optimistic or pessimistic at any given time. This is what biblical hope does. It fills our life with the vision of God, no matter if our life is completely at rock bottom or is at the height of ecstasy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. This is what verse 2 is trying to tell us. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I understand that a lot of Romans is written in very thick theological language. I get that. But what he means is that because of what Christ has done, peace with God, justified by faith, we who are Christian, we have confident joy in the future that God will bring when his glory fills the earth and he restores all things. A confident joy that everything sad will be untrue, that eternal winter will break and spring will have the final word. That in the words of one of my favorite musical artists, Chance the Rapper, in his unreleased song that he only performed on Colbert and promised would be on his new album but was not, 
so much for hoping. He says this in his in this song. He says, the day is coming, knees bowed, tongues confessing, the last one getting first dibs on blessing. The day is on its way. It couldn't wait no more. And then Daniel Caesar, who sings a song with him, is in the background. And he's singing, here it comes, ready or not, here it comes. Here, the day is coming. That, that day, that day of hope is coming. It's breaking into the present no matter what. Be ready or not, here it comes. See, when Paul says in Romans that we boast in the hope of the glory of God, he's saying what chance is singing, that we will have the steady, confident joy that God that, that God's day is coming. It's coming. And we hope in that coming day. And it fills our present, no matter what we're living through, with confident, stubborn joy. This hope, that vision of life that guides itself by faith in God's promise, irrespective of whether the situation looks optimistic or pessimistic at any given time, that hope. Now, how do we, how do we have joyful, how do we have the hope but have it joyfully? Now, that could be stubborn joy, but how do we have joyful hope? So let's talk about, let's talk about joy for a second. Look at verse um, 11 and 12 in, in, chapter, in chapter 12. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now, this all sounds great, but it's better read as a list of things that we don't have much of anymore, right? Zeal, spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, hope, patience, faithful, especially after the last 15 months we've lived through, a lot of us are like depleted. We're tired. Our zeal tank is on empty. Our spiritual fervor is down. Hope is a long way off and patience wouldn't be the best way to describe that anxious pit in our stomach. The question is, how do we build up our zeal, fervor, patience, and faithfulness? And the answer is joy. Neurobiologists or people who study the brain and brain chemistry have found that joy in the brain is directly connected to the regulation of our emotions and, in, and our ability to endure suffering. In other words, joy is directly connected to our zeal, our spiritual fervor, patience, and even faithfulness. Jonathan Grant, in his book on human sexuality, writes this quote, Neurobiologists have shown that while most brain development stops sometime in childhood, the brain's joy center, located in and observable in the right orbital prefrontal cortex is the only part of the brain that never loses its capacity to grow. As Dr. James Friesen and his colleagues explain, when the joy center has been sufficiently developed, it regulates emotions, pain control, and immunity centers. It guides us to act like ourselves. It releases neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and it is the only part of the brain that overrides the main drive centers, food and sexual impulses, terror and rage. Without sufficient joy strength, we spend the rest of our lives trying to fill the deficit. Joy strength and joy capacity is central to living well in, an, in the, the last 15 months that we lived in and beyond. So how do we build that joy capacity? Neuroscientist out of UCLA, Dr. Alan Shore, in his research on the brain and behavior, discovered that the human brain develops in a person through joy and attachment. He defined joy as this, quote, joy is defined as, relationally as someone who is glad to be with me and being the sparkle in someone else's eye. In other words, brain science reveals that joy, which is crucial for emotional and relational development, is directly tied to seeing the face of another person who is glad to be with us. And when that happens, it fills up our joy capacity and our emotional gas tank. There is nothing that fills us when I come home from work and my two-year-old hears the door open and she says, daddy, daddy, and runs to me and her face lights up when she sees me, gives me a hug. Um, if you're a parent, you know that that is the, the, the epitome of joy strength. Like you can get through anything with that. This uh, builds our joy. This kind of thing happens when we walk into a community group, when we walk into church, when we walk in, when someone sees us that hasn't seen us for a while or just loves to be around us and their face lights up when they see us and we see their face light up when they see our face. This is how our joy capacity is increased. This is consistent with some very important texts of scripture. 
I think I, oh wait, I'm still recording, sorry. I think my, my screen just went out, but I'm back. Um, in other words, um, uh, if, if, uh, if you've ever read uh, Numbers uh, 6, 24 through 26, the Lord bless, I read this to my, over my daughter every single night, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Face, shining, face toward you, joy. This is literally written in the 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 ironic blessing, the, the the priestly blessing. May God turn his face on you. May his face shine on you and bring you peace and bring you joy and br be gracious to you. Again, Psalm 1611, in your presence there is the fullness of joy. Psalm 1611. Now, if you have Bible software, you can click on that word presence and it will literally say the face that turns on you. Face on you, joy. Joy is built into our brains and our lives through God's face. It's wired into us. Like I love, by, by the way, I love um, the, the neurobiological studies because it's, it, it so overlaps with how how God teaches us endurance and strength and perseverance and joy and all the things. It it, it does all those things. So, um, Jim Wilder, who calls himself a neurotheologian and who was a student of Dallas Willard, writes, quoted from his book um, on the subject with Michael Hendricks. He says, when there are, when we are the sparkle in someone else's eyes, their face lights up with a smile when they see us, we feel joy. From the moment we are born, joy shapes the chemistry, structure, and growth of our brain. Joy lays the foundation for how well we handle relationships, emotions, pain, and pleasure throughout our lifetime. Joy creates an identity that is stable and consistent over time. Joy gives us the freedom to share our hearts with God and others. Expressing our joyful identity creates space for others to belong. Joy gives us the freedom to live without masks because in spite of our weakness, we know we are loved. We are not afraid of our vulnerabilities or exposure. Joy gives us the freedom from fear to live from the heart Jesus gave us. We discover increasing delight in becoming the people of God knew we could be. I think my point is this. We are coming out of a collective moment of low, low joy. Since we have had little or no joy interaction with our community over the last year and a half, the only way to build this joy is by seeing someone face to face. The brain knows the difference between a screen and a real person. We know this. It's canonized in our science fiction. If you've not ever read Ready Player One, you have to. This is this. We know this to be true. Our neuro, neurological circuits do not react to screens the same way that they react to real faces. So I guess what this sermon is really about is the, the need for Christian community. You know how we're going to build up our joy? In, as Christian community, you know how we're going to build up our hope as Christian community? We, we need each other. The Christian community is so very tied to our Christian hope. And our Christian hope is so very tied to our Christian joy. We need community for this to happen. When we are together, it builds up our joy capacity. When we build up our joy capacity, we can endure all the suffering when we can endure all the suffering, that suffering produces in us hope that will not disappoint. So this is where I'll end. Since joy helps us regulate painful emotions, when it runs low, we will look to non-relational sources to help stop the pain. Meaning we choose joy substitutes. Things like food, social media, shopping, alcohol, drugs, pornography. Some of those are normal and good things and others are addictions waiting to happen, training our brain to receive joy in disordered ways and thus deforming our character and life with God not forming us into Christlikeness. Our joy can start to be built up right now by looking to Christ, by looking to his face, receiving from him the light that comes from his face, allowing that to warm us, to convince us of our belovedness in Christ, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine in the darkness, 
made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this, this retreat. And I pray, Lord, that what? As we move into our tomorrow, as we move into the hope of the future you're bringing, it would be bolstered by Christian community that brings us joy. We need joy and the joy capacity that only Christian community can bring. So would you do that, God? Do that in this church. Do that in our church. Do that in your church, God. And Lord, may we look to you. Ultimate joy comes from seeing your face and your face shining upon us. Would you bring that joy too? In Jesus' name, amen. And church, it was really good to be with you. I wish I was there in person so I could see your face and you could see my face. But until then, peace to you.